with me in your Bibles to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 7. We're continuing our series in Mark. Uh, and, and as we do, I'd like to ask you a question point or a question. Have you ever hit your breaking point? What is your breaking point? Think about that for just a second. Uh, and, and I'd like to share with you a quick story about uh, when I really saw when someone had, they, they, they had nothing else left. They had exhausted every ounce of strength and emotional energy that they had, and, and they just couldn't go on. And it's in this great series uh, that was, I think, produced by HBO called Band of Brothers. Now, if you have not seen the Band of Brothers, I strongly encourage you to do so. If you are under 18, make sure you get your parents' permission before you do. There's definitely some blood and gore in this movie because it's based upon World War II. It, the whole uh, series, it's a, it's a mini-series, the whole series is uh, based upon following this group of soldiers called the 101st Airborne. And their job was that they would fly over enemy lines and then parachute behind the enemy in order to be able to attack the line, the, the German line, from both sides. They were very effective and they were very good at their job. Uh, one of the funny parts about the series is it just seemed to be tradition that when anyone got shot, they would always get shot in the butt. And so a bunch of them would have to go to the doctor uh, after being shot, removed from the line, they'd get the bullet taken out. And then normally today, if you got wounded, you'd get a purple heart and then you would go um, uh, back home because you got wounded in battle and, and that was you serving your country. They would get the bullet pulled out and then they'd go back to the front line and they'd fight some more. Uh, an incredible group of soldiers. The, the man that I have there was one of my favorite characters in the series. He was a lieutenant, but he was a lieutenant who really cared for his soldiers. Uh, rather than just trying to win medals or trying to be a, 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 a macho man, he wanted to have a deep abiding relationship with his soldiers and he wanted them to know that he would put his life on the line for them as he would expect them to put their lives on the line for him. And so the people who followed him were, uh, were very much inspired by him and he had an excellent unit. The problem was is that during the Battle of the Bulge, when German forces were trying to put heavy pressure on the United States line, they had parachuted into a place that was up north and the ground was frozen and they were constantly being shelled by artillery. And the only thing that they could do is to dig these foxholes that hopefully would provide for them enough cover uh, in, in, in order to be able to withstand the constant bombardment. And during one of those bombardments, two of his friends, their foxhole was specifically hit by a bomb. And when they tried to pull the, the people out of those foxholes and get them, they were still alive. But like one of his friends, his legs, like when they tried to pick up the legs, the, 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 just, the muscle and the tissue just came right off. That's how horrible that event was. And when he saw his friends now wounded and never able to return again, he lost his will. That was his breaking point. He lost the will to be able to go on. He had nothing left to give. And they kind of just, they, they, they knew it. They knew he was a broken man. And they made up some form of reason in order to say medically he can't continue to fight. Because he, he just wasn't able to anymore. Have you ever reached a point like that in your life? I know a lot of you are young. And so you go like, well, maybe not me. I mean, uh, yeah, I've maybe gotten a bad grade on a test or something. And was scared to tell my parents. But what about you who are a little bit older? What about you who are adults? Have you ever reached that point where you really question whether or not you have the strength to go on? That's a difficult place to be, for sure. It's hard. And it's a place that sometimes 
many people never come back from. What do you do in that type of situation? How do you handle it? Do you turn to drugs and alcohol in order to try to forget it? Do you go to the Lord and maybe ask for some aid, but you're unsure whether or not he's really paying attention? Or do you honestly, with a full and, and, and bold heart, go before his throne, knowing that he will give you the aid that you need? Today, let's take a look at a quick story in Mark chapter 7, verse, starting in verse 24. Mark chapter 7 and verse 24. That gives us a model of how we should come before God. It's a very quick story. There's not a lot to cover. So I know a lot of you are like, oh, maybe we'll get out early today. Maybe. But I have another passage I want to connect it to. So bear with me as we first read this story of the Syrophoenician woman in the area of Tyre. So Mark chapter 7, verse 24, let's read these five verses together, or six verses together. And from there, he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him, came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician at birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon was gone. Wow. That's a powerful little story. Yet it has Jesus doing something that really shocks us. Why did Jesus do what he did? It's in order to show us the picture that he wants us to have in terms of our relationship with him. It begins, remember, in Mark. Now, Mark is not written um, in the same way that Luke is where, uh, where it is in like a timeline, Okay. Uh, Luke has Jesus doing uh, X, Jesus doing Y, Jesus doing Z, because it's all in sequential order. Mark is thematic. And so while Jesus is in this sort of Decapolis area, Mark sort of tells a bunch of stories now of Jesus interacting specifically with Gentiles. So in Mark, this section is all about Gentile ministry. Now, Jesus goes from where he is in the Decapolis. If you notice, you can see sort of the Decapolis there at the bottom. That's where he landed. That's where a lot of the people were, were now coming and bringing in blankets of, uh, of, and sheets of people who are sick and demon-possessed to Jesus in order to heal. He stops that, and now he takes off northwest, going all the way out of Israel. This is not even in the land of Palestine anymore. And he goes to this city called Tyre and to the area the surrounding region of Tyre. And he goes there. We have no idea why. Maybe there was some business that he was following someone there. The guy wanted him to come along. He agreed. We don't know. He just shows up in Tyre. But the word about what Jesus has done in the Decapolis, about what Jesus has done in Nazareth, about what Jesus has done in Capernaum, about what Jesus' disciples have done all throughout the area has gotten even to Tyre. So as Jesus goes to Tyre, he wants to be able to sort of sneak into this house, sort of have a little bit of respite where he's not having to do miracle after miracle after miracle. Maybe he can just teach some people quietly and then sneak away and make sure no one is the wiser. The problem is it's Jesus, he can't, right? Imagine celebrities today, 
especially today where everybody is on their phones. We can instantly know sometimes whenever a celebrity goes to some place. In Jesus's day, it's even though they don't necessarily know him by face and they don't have cameras and can be able to make the announcements, people know enough that when Jesus shows up, everybody wants to be invited. Everybody wants to be there. And Jesus just wasn't able to get away. Okay, so he's in this house and lo and behold, where he's trying to be alone with his disciples and with whoever is the owner of the house, there's this woman, this woman who is not a Jew. She's a Gentile. She is um, Syrophoenician by birth, which means she's way up north from, uh, from Israel. She has made her way down to Tyre, hearing that Jesus is close by. And, and now she's seeking an audience. She gets into the home and she falls prostrate on her hands and knees in front of Jesus, begging, begging Jesus to come to her house to cast out the demon that has now taken control of her little girl. She's begging Jesus, heal my daughter. That's a woman who's reached her breaking point. She has nothing else that she can do except for plead for Jesus to have a modicum of mercy on her. Please, Jesus, do something now. I have no other options left. I need you. Help me, please. When you get to that point in your life, you feel constantly like there's this weight, this burden upon your shoulders. You wake up with it, you go to sleep with it. You're constantly replaying decisions that you have made over and over and over again in your mind, making sure you have made the right one. You may have some bit of hope like this woman has, and trust me, I bet she imagined that conversation with Jesus every night before she ever got to see him face to face. Rehearsing, practicing, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? She had it down. She had it down to the point that exactly what she wanted to have happen, happen. She got into the house with Jesus. She now prostrated herself before him, begging him, please have mercy upon me. Spare my daughter from this demonic possession. But Jesus doesn't have the conversation go any way like what she imagined. What does he do? He looks at her and says, I don't think so. Mm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to come with you. I'm not going to do it. Could you imagine the, 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 the terror that must have overwhelmed her as she is now rejected by her only hope. He says, I don't want to do it because first I should feed the children. Who are the children that he's talking about? The Jews. First, my ministry, my business is to heal the Jews, is to preach to the Jews is to teach to the Jews, I don't have time to go to your daughter and take care of her and do my primary job. And he says it in such a insulting way. He says, no, I, I don't want to do this because it's not good to give the bread of the children to the dogs. Did Jesus just call her a dog? What? I mean, we, we think of Jesus as a sort of nice, stately man who's, who's you know, says everything nice and filled with love and just everybody who goes behind him. But this is just, he kind of a little ornery here. Like he's not really friendly. This is kind of like cranky Jesus. It's 
woken up on the wrong side of the bed. This is the same type of Jesus who yelled at the storm, shut up. Then the storm went, sorry. Right? And I, I, I don't want to go because I, I don't want to give the food of the Jews to the dogs. Now, I bet you some of the disciples are like, Ooh, hey, Jesus. I mean, we think that, but we don't say that. But Jesus did. Why? Why would Jesus do something like this? Isn't it a little harsh? Yes. But the whole purpose of this is to get to this answer. This answer that she gives blows me away. Every time I read the story, she just is amazing. And we don't even know her name. What is this amazing answer that she gives? We read it, and here it is. She says, yes, it's not good to give the children's food to the dogs. She agrees with Jesus. I'm a dog. But, Lord, even the dogs eat under the table the scraps that the children leave behind. So she is saying to Jesus, okay, you don't need to come and give me your best. I just want your scraps. If you can't give me your best, give me that. Wow. Do you have that kind of longing that kind of understanding of your need for Jesus. There is a horrible saying that's out there. Uh, you might have heard of it. It goes like this. Better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. That is stupid. One, there is no ruling in hell. You are not going to be in command of anything. You are going to be hurting in hell. But two, the reason that it is so horrible is I would rather have a shack in heaven, a broken down dump to live in if I am in heaven with my savior than to have a palace in hell where I would know that I would be separated from my savior forever. Even if I could rule in hell, it would be far better for me to have a small corner of heaven, just the scraps, than to get anything and everything that I wanted, but miss the connection and relationship with Almighty God. That is what is so powerful about what this woman said. She recognizes her deep need, and she knows Jesus I'll take anything you can give me. Anything is acceptable. I just need a little bit of you. That's what we need to do when we are at our breaking point. We should go to God just like the Syrophoenician woman. Why? Because of Jesus' response makes it all the more clear. She says, because of that word, you can leave. That demon has already come out of your daughter. Jesus wanted to see her faith. And how did Jesus see her faith? Because she boldly said, I'll take anything you got. Jesus wants to see our faith. So I ask you, how do you approach Jesus? Do you approach Jesus timidly? Because I hear a lot of Christians even say this. Well, you know, I, I do pray, but I don't know. God has, I'm sure he has a lot more important things to worry about than me. No, he doesn't. No, he does not. 
He does not have a single thing in the entire universe that he sees as more important than you. Each and every one of you are such an apple in his eye. He literally moved heaven and earth so that you could have that relationship with him. You are the most important thing in the universe to him. You have infinite value before the Lord Almighty God. Which is why Hebrews gives us exactly how we should go to God in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Let's turn there in our Bibles right now. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 and read how we should be like this Syrophoenician woman and how the Bible tells us we should go before our Lord. You ready? Hebrews chapter four, verse 14 through 16. Here's what it says. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. So let us, here's the kicker. So let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Church, have you reached your breaking point? Are you to a point in your life where the thing that you need right now more than anything else in all of the created universe is you just need whatever scrap of mercy Jesus is able to give you? If you're at that place, how do you draw near to the Lord? How do you come before God? Do you come before God more concerned with you and your moral failure or do you come before God knowing what he thinks of you and willing to boldly ask him for whatever it is that you need? Are you at that point in your life where that's how much you need Jesus? If you're not, wait a while, you will be. And when you get there, Jesus is saying, I want you to boldly ask. I want you to come before me with confidence that I love you and I'm going to intervene. What does he say? He starts his passage by saying, because we have this understanding of our high priest. Well, what is a high priest and what's that all about? In the Old Testament, it was the high priest that took the sins of the people and represented the people before God. On a very special day, their very special day called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That was the only day that the high priest was actually able to go in to the presence of God. The high priest would have this special ceremony where he would purify himself and, and he would purify every instrument that he used and he would take the blood of a, of a very special lamb, a lamb sacrificed for the sins of people and he would pour that over the altar. The top of the altar was referred to as the mercy seat. He would pour that blood on top of the Ark of the Covenant in order to be able to to satisfy the wrath of God upon his people. He was begging God for mercy upon the children of Israel. That is the function of the Lord Jesus Christ for you. He is not sitting on his hands in heaven wondering, like, oh, where, when do I get to go back to earth? Hmm, time seems to just be dragging on. No, he is very busy in heaven. What is he busy doing? He is representing you to God. And he's constantly going before God the Father. And he's constantly telling him, your children need you. Your children need grace. Your children need mercy. Your children need love. Your children need endurance. Your children need passion. Your children need power. You're, stop it, Siri. I don't need you. Your children need you, God. Power needs to be given to them. And he begs God the Father on your behalf every single day. 
That's his job. We have confidence that Jesus is our high priest, but he's not a high priest like like what you might think of an Old Testament high priest. The Old Testament high priest, especially when you look at someone like Eli. Eli in the book of 1 Samuel was not a very good high priest. Why? Because his sons were priests and his sons were horrible human beings and he was getting fat off of the sins of Hophni and Phinehas. He was letting them steal and he was reaping the reward for it. When you have that kind of image of a high priest, they don't know what you're going through. Sure, they might go before God on your behalf, but it's like, I don't really think this guy understands. Jesus perfectly understands you. Why? Because we can cling to the confession that we don't have a high priest who doesn't understand our weaknesses. He does. Because every single thing you have been through he has been through worse. You want to think about your breaking point? Think about the one part of your life where it was really hard for you to endure. Imagine Jesus. What's going on? Is it static is going through? Oh, I did the whole first part of the sermon and they can't hear on YouTube. Is that it? Just, oh. Stupid technology. Murphy's Law says, if it can go wrong, it will. Dr. Gary Reibold of Irvine Valley says, and with technology, at the worst possible times. So, I'm using the normal handheld mic. Oh, well. All right, I was on a roll, and I got blown off. Where was I? Okay. Um, that he can sympathize with our weaknesses because everything he has been tempted with, he has gone through, everything we have been tempted with, he has gone through worse. You want to say, oh, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I've, I've never felt so alone. Are you kidding? Jesus has felt greater loneliness than you could ever imagine. Imagine the night just before Jesus is going to die and he goes to his disciples and he says, pray with me. I'm under a lot of stress. And he goes before a tree in order to pray for how much stress he's under. So much stress that literally the blood vessels in his skin are bursting, allowing him to sweat blood. And he's crying out to God because he knows what's coming and his body doesn't want to go through it but he knows it's the only way and he's all by himself praying and praying and praying and he gets up in order to find some comfort in his friends and what are they doing <sighs> he needs them and they're asleep and he needs God and God has to have Jesus go through with this and so he's totally and completely alone. In fact, to such a degree, he is the only one that we can actually say endured hell for us. Because on that cross, even God the Father and God the Holy Spirit had to turn their back on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he cries out, Lama, 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 Lama. sorry. Lama Lama Savakthani, if I can speak tonight, today, whatever it is, I am off. It's this microphone thing, jacked me up. All right. He was completely alone on our behalf. Do you realize that? He endured loneliness for you. You want to talk about temptation? Imagine starving to death. Some of you are sort of getting that. It's already 12 o'clock and your stomach's going, Aah. right? You're saying, oh, I'm, I'm hungry. Jesus was hungry. We have, we have maybe even done something like fasted and not eaten an entire day. <gasps> wow, you're holy. Jesus skipped 40 days. When you don't have that much food, your body is now eating itself. He could die if he had gone any longer without food. All to be at his weakest moment so that he can experience temptation 
at the weakest possible moment of existence and still defeat it. Oh, he knows what it's like to feel pain. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to be broken on our behalf. He knows. He's kind of like a friend that can complete your sentences. That's how much he knows you. My best friend and I, we have been best friends since we were four years old. He and I one time were, were doing a, a church event and we were in the, the car of our youth group leader and we were heading out to the event. I forget what the event was, but I remember the car ride because of what happened. We were on the ride and we were sort of looking out. We were all in the back of his truck. And back then, if you were in the back of a truck, you didn't need seatbelts. We didn't have seatbelts. We were just on these kind of benches, looking out the window, staring. And all of a sudden, we saw this car, this beautiful red car. Now, I am not a car lover. Like, I could see a car on the road and be like, wow, that is a pretty car. And you'd be like, what? And I'm like, I don't know. It's just a car. But I couldn't tell you the make and the model, know nothing about it, but I know a beautiful car when I see one. That car was a gorgeous red car. And we looked at that and I said, wow. And I said, yeah, but I don't know about the color red because red tends to get tickets more than any color in terms of higher percentages, not actual number. White is the one that gets the most tickets in actual number because every car is white, right? That's why they get so many tickets. But red gets the highest percentage of tickets because it looks like it's going faster. So whenever you see this hot red car, that's why the cops with the radar guns are going, like, ooh, right? And then they get a ticket because they're going fast, okay? Everybody's going fast. They just look good and that's why they get spotted. So I, I said, I don't know about red. They kind of get ticketed a lot. And I said, I, I don't know. I'd probably like that car even more if it was in something like metallic blue. And my friend went, yeah. And then we looked at each other and at the exact same time said together in unison or black. <laughs> and we just, we, we knew it. We'd, it was just like such a connection. It was like we thought the exact same way. Do you know Jesus knows you so well? He thinks the exact same way you do. So he understands your problem. He understands the hurt inside of you. He understands everything about you. So that means you don't have to worry going to Jesus thinking, I don't know if he's going to get this. Yes, he will. And yes, he does. So if you're ever feeling, Lord, you probably have bigger things to worry about. That is a lie of the devil. Stop it. If you're ever thinking to yourself, I don't know if God's really going to understand my unique situation. That's a lie from the devil. Stop it. He knows. He gets it. He understands it. Some of you young people are like, does he? I mean, he doesn't have Asian parents. Yes, he did. His parents didn't. I mean, they, I don't know if they really understood if Jesus really knows what it's like that parents don't really understand him, are you kidding me? He is the poster child for parents not understanding him. He's God. Of course his parents don't understand. He knows everything. Everything that you could ever experience because he went through a worse case than you can ever imagine. Which is why we should be willing to follow what the command is from Hebrews in the next verse. What is that command? Hebrews 4.16 says, Then we might then with boldness come to him. With boldness. Like that Syrophoenician woman. With boldness, stand up in front of Jesus and say, I need you now. With boldness, ask for mercy. That's an odd thing to do. Right? When, you're mercy, when you need mercy, that's, you recognize you're, you're asking for something that, that 
you deserve punishment, but you're asking for mercy. But you can boldly ask. You can boldly ask for grace. Well, wait a minute. Grace is when you're getting what you don't deserve. Yes. You can know I don't deserve any of this. But I'm still asking God because I need you now. I'm at my breaking point. I'm hurting. I need your intervention. And if I don't get it, I'm going under. God, step in and help me. We don't think of it like that. Because when we imagine God, he is just this almighty God. We need to retrain our mind to think of him differently. How do we do that? Think of it like having a bunch of titles. I have a bunch of titles. Okay? I've had lots of titles in my life. I'm dad. I'm son. I'm a professor. I'm a pastor. I'm a coach. I'm all kinds of titles. And every title has a little bit of respect that's associated with it. Right? My kids call me daddy. In fact, I remember, they don't do this anymore, but I remember when my son and daughter were really young and I would walk into the door after a hard day of work, I would hear them call from upstairs, daddy! And they'd go running out of whatever room they were in and down the stairs and like jump at me and, and, and I'd grab them and give them a big hug because I loved the fact that they loved when I was home. I miss those days. Although don't try that now, you'll... Knock me over, okay? It was, it was fun, right? Dad has a certain amount of respect associated with it. Professor has a certain amount of respect that's associated with it. When I walk into a classroom and someone needs help and says, Professor, can I ask you a question, right? There's a certain amount of respect that comes with that title, right? And so everybody sort of treats the person based upon that level of respect, right? And when you know you're asking someone of a high level of respect, we tend to think of that power differential and say, I, I better make my request reasonable. But I want to tell you quickly about this one event that helped me understand this. This involves my son, Josiah. I was getting ordained, okay? I was going to be now officially a pastor. Before that time, I was called at my churches what's called a, a jundosinim. A jundosinim is like an evangelist. It's the best way to translate it. But it, essentially in English, I was an assistant pastor. I had not yet been ordained. But I graduated from, uh, from Talbot Theological Seminary. I got my Master of Divinity. And, 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 and um, I had now joined a denomination, the denomination that my church was associated with. And they said, we're, we have, I took this test. This test was very difficult. I had to have a Bible knowledge test where I got at least an 85% correct. Um, uh, and I did. I passed the test. No problem. Old Testament and New Testament. No problem. Passed it. They then asked questions and I was now getting ordained. I was now going from just an assistant pastor to now being a fully fledged pastor that every church now recognize I am an ordained minister. And so I can now go into hospitals and I can perform weddings and I can do all the things that come with that special ordination. Even denominations that are not the denomination that ordained me recognize that ordination. Okay? I was going to be ordained. And so we had for this special ceremony, we invited all my family, my extended family came, my, my aunts and my uncles and many of them are not even believers. We invited the church that was going to house it, that was going to do the ordination ceremony, and a pastor that had seen me grow up in the faith since I was in high school, and we did it at his church. I invited my old pastor that baptized me to come, and we, we were able to find him, and I was, I was able to see him again. I hadn't seen him in years. And we invited my seminary professor, Dr. Richard Rigsby, who taught me Hebrew, to give the message to the congregation while I was going to be ordained. And my job was to kind of sit there and sort of 
give a short testimony, but to receive the blessing of all the pastors who went through this ordination process. And so I was on the stage, sort of sitting down in a chair, just sort of watching all the ceremony take place. And pastors would come up and sit down, and, and, and all of a sudden I noticed something. It was my son, Josiah. See, everybody else was being a good congregant. They were all sitting down. They were all facing the, the pastor and watching the, the sermon and stuff. And here's little Josiah. He was probably maybe two, three years old at the most. And he slowly started to creep along the floor. Just inch at a time. Then he started to sit on the stairs. Then he started to crawl up. Always looking at me. And then he watched. And when I noticed him. This is my son. He doesn't understand all of this. He understands one thing. The guy on the stage is daddy. And I want to be with daddy. So I looked at him. And I said. And right in the middle of Dr. Richard Rigsby preaching, there's Josiah joining me on stage. Because that's my son. My son gets to do what other people don't get to do. Nobody can run up and join me on stage because they're not my son. Nobody else could just sit in my lap. Imagine if another congregant did that. That would be weird. <laughs> but it's not weird for him because I'm daddy. And the reason why I love this story so much is not just because of what Josiah did. I mean, he was bold, right? He's like, I don't care what anybody else is, dude. That's my dad, right? He was bold. But because of what that did to the other members of the church, when I said, come on, my uncle Wes, he's Mormon. He's not a believer. No, not Wes, sorry. Les. Wes is Catholic. Um, my uncle Les, who is who married into, he married my wife's sister, okay? My uncle Les is Mormon. And, and he Loves to take pictures. He was taking a bunch of pictures of the whole event. That's why I actually have this picture of, of me and my son. It was from his camera. And he said, I just loved it when your son came on stage with you. That was something special to him. Because he saw the importance of family. My son was just, if not, if not more important than anything that was happening up on that stage. That is God's feeling of you. When you're thinking that I don't know if God's going to accept me, and I just maybe need to creep, just sort of see if I can catch his, his eye, he takes one look at you and he says, come. Come to my throne. Ask me for whatever you want because you're not some lowly subject. You're a precious son or a beautiful daughter that's the apple of his eye and he longs with bated breath to hear whatever it is that you want to say. Yeah. He has a bunch of titles. Almighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. But his favorite from your lips is Abba. Daddy. I just need you. Now you might say, but I don't have a father like that in my life. 
I've never known that kind of an example. I've never had that close relationship with my dad. I don't know how to really be close to God the Father because I don't have that kind of father. I have a solution for you. Come join me at father school. You might not have had that kind of relationship with your father. But at that school, you can learn to forgive him. And you can learn to be the kind of father that God the father resembles to your family. Now you might say, but I'm not a father yet. That's okay. We'll train you anyway. We just want young men to be able to grow up to be good fathers so that they can be that kind of model for their children of who God is for us. So if you at all want to improve what your relationship is, men, with your children, with your spouse, or you just want to be prepared to be a good husband, to be a good father, come and sign up for this retreat, March 10th and 11th. I'm one of the people that's going to be helping to guide and, 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 and direct this retreat. So come with me, join me, and I, I promise you it is going to be a life-changing event. I have been to three major conferences that are like this. I've been to Tres Dias, okay? I've been to um, Pilgrimage of Love, okay? That's for couples. And I've been to Father School. All of them have similar kinds of things that they do. My favorite of all of them is father school. So come men. Women, I'm sorry, we don't have a mother school. But maybe they'll come up with some soon. We do have father school. And our culture is in desperate need of good dads. God the Father wants to be a loving father to you no matter what your relationship is with your father. He wants to be that daddy. That's very special. So much so that he is begging you, be like this Syrophoenician woman. What happened when she implored Jesus to cast out the demon from her daughter? What did she do when she went boldly before Jesus? What happened was that her boldness was rewarded with mercy and grace. Jesus cast out the demon, not even having to see her daughter. So then what happens to us when we implore Jesus to intervene in our circumstances? What happens is that our boldness is rewarded with mercy and grace. So, GCCI, you have access to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. In fact, he's commanding you, come, come to me and ask me for whatever you wish. We, may not, we might not get exactly what we want, but I promise you everything you get will be greater than you could ever ask or imagine. Let's pray. Lord, may we never forget that you are a good, good father. A father that desperately loves his children. A father that gave up everything, that sacrificed everything so that we could have a relationship with you. And you know all of our weaknesses, all of our pain, all of our hurt. You can sympathize with all of it because you've been through it too. And far worse than we could ever imagine. So Lord, I pray, I ask, may this church now understand how much you want us to come. How desperately you're seeking 
for us to have that kind of boldness, to go to you on a regular basis, to cry out to you and say, God, I need you. I need you right now. Please come. Give us your presence. Pour out your love. Help us to feel and understand from the depths of our soul how much we are cherished by you so that we can learn, much as my son did with me, that he has a special access that nobody else does because you're not just the king of kings, you're dad. We can run and yell, daddy, and jump into your arms. And you will always care for us. You will always love us. You will never turn us away. So Lord, please, please, may we experience today the depths of your great love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.